Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Corps. So looking at this footage here, you might be thinking, wow, he's playing Super Mario Bros. 3. But this is not just any Super Mario Bros. 3 here. This is actually the exact copy of the version that I played as a child. And that's because in this video, as you'll see, I actually backed up the original Nintendo cartridge that I had as a kid, and I made a ROM file out of it, and now I put it on one of my favorite retro handhelds. And so in this video, I'm gonna show you how I managed to do that. And it's all thanks to this little cartridge reader here that was built by a team called Save the Hero Builders. What they've done is they've taken an open source DIY project and done all of the work for you. And so rather than spend the next several months figuring out how to solder and order my own PCB and everything else like that, this service will take all that guesswork out of the equation and leave you with a cartridge reader that'll work on a ton of different systems. For example, just right out of the box, you're going to be able to back up cartridges for the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Nintendo 64. And the team also sells special adapters that can be used for these systems here. And so altogether you have the opportunity here to back up most of the old retro cartridges from back in the day. And one of the coolest things about the project is that it won't only back up the game, but it'll back up your save files too. And so after spending some time backing up all of my stuff using this tool, I was able to resume some games that I hadn't touched in over 20 years. And so if you're a collector of retro cartridges, or maybe you really just want to jump back into that old game of Dragon Warrior that you started 20 years ago, this might be something worth checking out. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, so Save the Hero Builders is based out of Japan, and like I mentioned, they're a service which will build these cartridge adapters based on open source work. And I'll leave a link to their website in case you want to check this out further. But the main thing you're going to want to look at here is their open source cartridge reader. They have a variety of different PCBs or spacer colors, as well as different acrylic or wood bases. Now in terms of price, it's not cheap. It starts at about $150, but can go all the way up to $180, depending on the different colors that you select. But as the company mentioned several different times on their website, you can actually just go to the open source project, which was created by someone named Sonny, and actually just build it all yourself. All the instructions and tools are available in here. And this is a really cool project to just kind of browse through. They're actually on version four of their cartridge reader at this point. And so you can kind of scroll through and look at the timeline and see the original one and kind of how they've improved it over the years. And it's gotten really slick over time. In fact, the one that's built by the Save the Hero Builders is actually the version three out of four. So there is a version four already available. And from what I've read, this one's a lot easier to build than the other versions. Either way, if you want to save a little bit of money or potentially just take on this project yourself, all of the tools that you want are available here on GitHub, including links to all of the parts that you're going to want and instructions on how to order your own PCB. And they're actually calling the version 3 that they're using through Save the Hero Builders as version 3 altered. And that's because there's been some slight changes to the overall project. For example, they added a Nintendo 64 controller pack reader, and they also relocated the Game Boy readers to make space for the acrylic case. Now, in addition to the cartridge reader itself, there are other things available that you can order from this website. For example, they have adapters that'll allow you to use Sega Master System games, original Famicom, Nintendo Entertainment System, as well as Neo Geo Pocket and the Wonderswan. And so let's do a quick unboxing of the package that came in the mail. First things first, I really appreciate that the box came with a little bit of a cat decor here. And my unboxing is probably going to be a little bit different than yours, and that's because mine didn't come directly from the company. Instead, a friend of mine named Juntaro over in Japan sent this over to me. And he has a really active Twitter account that focuses on retro gaming, specifically when it comes to mini handhelds. And so huge shout out to Jintaro for sending this over to me because this has been a lot of fun. And in addition to sending that cartridge reader over, he actually sent over some games so I could do some testing. And while I already did have some cartridges to test for this project, it's pretty cool to see some of these Japanese games showing up here. And the prices on these are amazing too. I don't know if these are recent prices, but 100 yen for a Super Nintendo game, 200 yen for a Nintendo 64, that's pretty crazy. That's about $1.25 or $2.50 per game. Now the company also sells stickers on their website. The proceeds from these actually go towards the war effort in Ukraine, so something that might be worth picking up. Mine also came with a QR code here, which will allow you to jump right into the user guide. And I'll also leave that linked in the video description. But yeah, here is the cartridge reader itself. It's actually a lot smaller than I thought it would be. Now, each of the different cartridge slots are labeled, as you can see here. So you have Nintendo 64, Genesis, and Super Nintendo. And up top, it has a Nintendo 64 controller adapter too, in case you want to back up a controller pack. 
Now underneath the main PCB, you can see some of the inner workings here. There's a power switch, as well as a barrel plug that actually isn't necessary at all, because the micro USB slot here on the left is actually where you will supply the power. On the opposite side, there are four different switches here, and these are different configurations that we'll go over here in a second. And finally, up in the front, you have your Game Boy cartridge slot here. As you can see, it's labeled on the bottom right corner. And this will work for Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, and the original Game Boy. And then also on the bottom left here is an SD card reader. I know each of these will come with a card. I'm not sure if you'll get a 4GB one like this or something a little bit smaller. Now they also sent out a couple adapters for me too. So I have the NES to Super Nintendo adapter here, which we're going to try out later. And then they also sent over the Sega Master System one too. Unfortunately, I don't have any Sega Master System games to test, so we'll just have to trust that that one works like all the others. Now, as you can imagine, adding your cartridge to the reader itself is super simple. You just take it facing forward and press it down. And it's gonna be the same process for any of these other cartridges. And so what we'll do in this video is we'll test out each of these different cartridge readers and see what the experience is gonna be like. And here's a closer look at that NES to Super Nintendo adapter. As you can see, they've basically soldered together two different cartridge adapters so that you can plug this directly into the Super Nintendo one, and then you plug your NES cartridge on top, and then you're ready to go. Now I will say that when you do add the NES adapter, it does get quite wobbly. So just make sure that you're careful when you're putting this all together. Now on Sony's GitHub page, it does have some user guides as well. And this will tell you what like each of those switches do and everything else like that. But to be honest, a lot of it is actually self-explanatory because it's written on the PCB itself. And so let's have a look at how that actually works. Next to each of the different consoles, it'll actually have the settings written right there on the board. And each of these settings will correspond to the switches that are available on the bottom right of the PCB. So say we look at Sega Genesis, it just says five watts. All we have to do then is just switch over the one from three watts to five watts, and then we're done. We're gonna leave all the other ones turned off. Now with Super Nintendo, it's five watts, but then also the CLK zero and one. And so we'll just go over here and flip those two switches. And so that's basically how it works per system. The Game Boy and Game Boy Advance instructions are also here. They're a little bit hard to see, but you can just kind of put your finger underneath and see them a little bit more clearly. Now, like I mentioned, this is going to be powered by micro SD. In terms of power delivery, you're going to want to use a 5 volt 1 amp adapter, kind of like those old small iPhone adapters. Or you can just plug it into a computer because it's going to know which wattage to give it. And like I mentioned, the barrel plug is not used at all. Okay, so we're ready to actually turn this on. Now, believe it or not, this has a tiny little OLED display. And I love the fact that it has this nice little light here on the top left. Now throughout this video, the OLED panel is gonna flicker like this, but in real life, you won't have any flickering at all. It is actually super smooth and clear looking. Now you have two buttons here. The leftmost button, when you press it once, it'll go down, and if you double click, it'll go up. And the one on the right is the confirm button. And that's basically it, very simple controls here. As you can see, it also shows a basic listing of all the different systems here. And if you go into the add-on section, you'll see some of the other systems that are also supported. These are the ones that are gonna require an adapter. All right, I'm excited to actually get started. We're gonna start with Super Mario World here. Again, we're gonna look at Super Nintendo, make sure it's set to five watts, and then click those other CLK switches too. Next, we're gonna add the cartridge and then turn the device on. You don't want to swap out cartridges while the device is running. Now it's kind of hard to see what's going on here at this angle, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna zoom in so you can get a better look. It's gonna be a little bit grainy, but I think you'll forgive me. And so we're gonna select Super Nintendo here, and it's gonna ask you which type of Super Nintendo cart you're using. We're just gonna pick a regular Super Nintendo cartridge, and with any luck, it's going to read the cartridge against the databases that are on the SD card, and it should recognize your game. As you can see here, it found Super Mario World. Next, we're going to press any button to get to the next menu here, and then we have the option to dump the ROM file and also the save as well. And if you'd like, you can actually add a save to the cartridge too. So we're going to dump the ROM first. It takes about five seconds. It's pretty awesome. Next, let's read the save file too. Okay, and now we're done with Super Mario World. We're gonna flip off the switch here and then remove the cartridge. Let's try the next one here, NBA Live 96. So exact same process, we'll add the cartridge and dump everything there. Next, let's do a Sega Genesis game. We're gonna flip off those two back switches, then add the cartridge here, turn the device on, and then we can navigate down to Mega Drive and same thing here, we can read the cartridge. And with any luck, it's going to recognize your game and then you can dump the ROM as well as the save file. This one took a little bit longer, 16 seconds altogether. And then it turns out I didn't have any save games on my NBA Jam cartridge. And that's it, you turn the device off, add the next game and you're ready to rock. Now let's try Nintendo 64. This one runs at three watts with the EEP switch flipped. 
Now, reading a Nintendo 64 cartridge is a little bit unique, and that's because the aftermarket cartridge slots have a little bit of play to them. And so what you're going to want to do is push the cartridge all the way to the left when you insert it. That'll make it so that it can read a little bit better. But even then, it's a little bit finicky. I would say about half the time, I would actually get an error when I tried to read the cartridge. But it's just a matter of trial and error. I would turn the board off and then reinsert the cartridge until it read correctly. And once I got the hang of it, it was no problem. And as you can imagine, the process to read the cartridge as well as the save is the exact same here, although it does take quite a bit longer. I'm going to cut through some of the waiting here, but as you can see here, it took almost 10 minutes altogether. But after that, it was all good. But let's move on to the handheld systems now. Let's start with Game Boy Advance. And same thing here, we're going to pop that in and then Game Boy Advance runs at 3 watts with everything else turned off. So in this case, I'm going to switch off the EEP from the Nintendo 64 configuration. And same thing here, in the menu we'll select Game Boy, and then we'll pick Game Boy Advance. And just like that, it recognized the cartridge. So same thing here, we're going to read the ROM. And this one actually takes quite a long time, upwards of about 5 minutes for a Game Boy Advance game. So I'm going to speed it up here, but one thing I did want to note is that the heart up here blinks as it's reading the ROM. It's kind of a nice touch. Okay, and once it's done, we're good to go. So let's do it for one more Game Boy Advance game. We're going to do F-Zero Maximum Velocity. I actually picked this one up at a swap meet a couple weeks ago, and it's got someone's name Robbie written on the back of it. Either way, same process. I'm going to read the ROM here. And I'm also curious to see whether or not there are any save games on here too. So I'm going to read the save too. And sure enough, it says there are some save games here. We'll check those out in a second. And then finally, let's do a Game Boy or Game Boy Color game. The only difference between Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color is that Game Boy and Game Boy Color run at 5 watts. Same thing here, we'll go into Game Boy and then Game Boy Color. And I also tried it on a couple Game Boy games, and as you can see here, these ones also threw some errors. But after wiping down the connectors with some alcohol, I was able to read these later on. So if you do get any errors, I would recommend cleaning your cartridges one more time and seeing if that'll work. And finally, well, let's do an NES game using this adapter. Now the configuration for NES is not labeled here, but it is in the GitHub page. And you basically just want to set it to 3 watts and turn everything else off. Next, let's add the game, turn on the system, and get into the NES menu. Now this one's a little bit complicated. We actually have to add our own mapper configuration. So let me show you how to do that. Back on the GitHub page, there's going to be a section about dumping NES games in particular. And this is where it shows you the configuration settings, but then also it has a link to NESCartDatabase.com. Within here, you can search for your game and then find the specific one you own. For example, I have the American version of Mario 3. Now there are four different values we need to note here. Number one is the INES mapper number. This is usually going to be one or a four. Next, you want the PRG size as well as the CHR size. And these kind of probably mean nothing to you. It's all good. And finally, you want the RAM size as well. What I would do is just keep this window open as you go through the menu. And so back on the cart, what we're going to do once we get into this NES menu is just go to the next section. And there's one called Select Mapper. You're going to pick that one here, and then you're going to add all that data. For example, under Mapper, it was 4. I already have this set to 4, but you would basically go through and toggle through to that last number, and then set it to the corresponding number. Next is going to be the PRG size, and if you remember, this was 256 kilobytes. So we're going to set that, then get to the CHR size. And for Mario 3, this is 128 kilobytes. And finally, under RAM, we're going to change it to 8. And that's it. This is all the mapper configuration you need to add. It is kind of a pain to have to put this in for every NES game, but that's just kind of how it goes. Finally, you're going to select Read Complete Cart. And so now it's going to go through and read and dump a bunch of different files that are specific to the NES. And after that, it's going to search through the database, and as long as everything is read correctly, it's going to set an NES header for you. What that means is it's basically going to take all these different files and then create a .nes file like you're probably used to if you use any sort of ROMs. And that's it. Once it's done, you're ready to go like any other ROM file. So let's take out that SD card and see what kind of treasures we have now inside. I'm going to connect this to my Windows PC, and as you can see right here in the root directory, there are a bunch of different folders with different system names on them. And as you drill down through these folders, you're going to find your game files. In the ROM section, I have two options here. One's called 16, and this one doesn't have a name, so this is probably that one Game Boy file that wasn't read correctly. But the other one is called Mario Golf, and within here we have a Mario Golf Game Boy file. So it looks like that one worked just fine. And as you can see here too, my Mario Golf save file is here as well. Same thing with Game Boy Advance. Here's F-Zero as well as Mario Kart. And it's kind of funny to me, a guy who works with ROM files all the time, I was so excited to see these ones that I created myself just over the course of one afternoon. So I'm going to take all of these folders, I'm going to copy them over to my desktop.
And just like that, I've made a backup of all these cartridges that I had as a kid. It's pretty awesome. Now I'm gonna add them to a retro handheld device because that's what I do on this channel. So I've got an SD card here that came from Amber Alec. And now I'm gonna take some of these ROM files and move them over onto this other SD card instead. So starting with Game Boy, I'm gonna grab Mario Golf and move that Game Boy file over. And then I'll just rinse and repeat and move all these other ROMs over into the corresponding folder. Now, if you want them to show up all nice and pretty within Emulation Station, you're probably gonna wanna change the file names to something a little bit more recognizable. And you'll also want to scrape the media and all the other things that you would do within Amber Elect. But for now, I'm just gonna move over the games as well as the save files if I did happen to dump those too. And the save files will go in the exact same spot as the games themselves. Okay, so I ejected the SD card. I'm gonna put it back into my device here. I'm using the Ambernic RG351MP running Amberlec pre-release. And as you can see from the navigation of the menus, all of those systems that I had originally dumped cartridges for are now appearing. So let's go into Game Boy Advance. And as you can see, there's F-Zero as well as Mario Kart. And F-Zero started right up. On top of that, we have Robbie's save games. I don't know who this hero was, you know, he sold it over to the swap meet, but now they're part of my collection. And it's funny because these are games that I've played for years at this point, but it's different when you're actually playing the cartridges that you yourself dump. And if you're like me, you've probably found that that process of dumping your cartridges is really intimidating and can get very expensive fast. And so that's a really cool aspect of this Save the Hero project. But personally, the thing I found the most cool was being able to resume save files from decades ago. As you can see here, check out these Super Mario World save files. Now I first bought this game about 20 years ago from a pawn shop in Central Texas, and I remember these three save files. The bottom two here are not my own. I never got further than the 12 levels that you can see in Mario A. But it's kind of amazing that these three save files that I remember from back in 2001, they're still here and now I can resume them too. If I open up one of these older ones here, as you can see, I've never gotten 77 levels into Mario World. For example, I have no idea what a chocolate fortress is, but it sounds delicious. And so I would say at the end of the day here, this whole experiment is kind of intangible. It's hard to explain how cool it is to play the original cartridge again on a new retro handheld. Theoretically, there's no difference between this game and any other ROM that you could potentially find on the internet. But I don't know, something about it, the fact that this is my cartridge here, now on a retro handheld, is kind of cool. And not only that, I can then move that ROM over to other retro handhelds too. For example, here is my Ambernic RG351V running the ArcOS custom firmware. And so it's kind of fitting to play one of these old Game Boy cartridges on a device that looks like a Game Boy 2. And just to be curious, I checked out some of those Japanese games that Juntaro had sent over to me from Japan. For example, I had heard of the Momotaro Dentetsu games before. These are like these board games that have been available for many, many years now. And while I didn't understand a single thing that was happening, it's kind of cool to have this little piece of Japan on my handheld. And it turns out the Japanese version of Wario Land 4 looks exactly like the American one. But until today, I actually didn't realize that there was a Puyo Puyo game available for the Genesis. Typically, I always have associated Columns as a puzzle game on the Genesis. So it's kind of cool to see this one too. And I never had an opportunity to play the Dragon Ball games on the original Super Nintendo back in the day. So it's kind of cool to see that now. But anyway, that's about it for this video. I just wanted to show off some of the cool opportunities that are available within the Save the Heroes cartridge reader. At the end of the day, this is probably a pretty niche thing. After all, not everybody has cartridges laying around their house. And additionally, there may not be as many people who actually want to play the original game files or game saves from those cartridges too. But you know, one of my favorite things about the whole retro emulation scene is the idea of preserving some of these games. And I get it, the argument could be made that someone could just go to like an online archive and download a full ROM set in the course of 10 minutes. Because at the end of the day, somebody has already preserved all of these games and they're available on the internet. But at the same time, I find it really cool to try it out myself. And honestly, the ability to jump back into a save game from 20 years ago to me is kind of priceless. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this something you might be interested in doing in the future? And I'll leave links to the Save the Hero Builders project in the video description below. They're running their first batch of pre-orders right now, and it's gonna be available for about the next three weeks as of making this video. And so if you're interested, you can jump in there and get in the first batch or wait for the second one and so on. And they've also given me a coupon code, which I'll leave in the video description below. It's only for a couple dollars, but all the same, it's nice to have. Either way, this was a really fun project and video to make, so thanks to Juntaro and the Save the Hero Builders for sending this out to me to try out. And as always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.